All right, so we are in our um, series in uh, 1 Timothy, How to Do Church Right. And we come today to uh, the title of this sermon being The Lifestyles of Leadership. And we are going to look at pastors and what is expected of pastors in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. So we'll be looking at the character of a, a church leader, but we will all benefit from this sermon because Christ-like character is the goal of all disciples. Amen? So let's pray, and then we will uh, get into the text. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the worship set, Lord, on holiness. And Father, thank you for this text that describes what you expect from a church leader, from an elder, a pastor, a bishop. And uh, Father, I pray today that in looking at this text, everyone will see what the highest moral standard of character looks like, which is Christ-like character, and everyone in our church will aspire to be like Christ. So, Father, I pray that you will speak to us clearly this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. So, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Here's what the Word of God says. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So in verse 1, we will clarify titles. I don't know about you, but I've always wondered this word bishop. In your Bible, it may say overseer, or it may have a, a note that says overseer. But if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. So what exactly is a bishop? And is a bishop the same thing as a pastor or an elder? So the title that you see here, bishop, literally means in the Greek, someone who watches over. Episcope, epe is over. Scope is to look or to watch with scope. So we can see that a bishop and an overseer is absolutely the same person. So is this the same office as a pastor or elder because I don't call myself a bishop? Sometimes I hear people joking around that you're a bishop. Well, what does that mean? Well, so an elder is a spiritually mature man in this context, not necessarily an older man, 
but a spiritually mature man who meets the qualifications outlined in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And you will also see those qualifications in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. So we have this bishop as someone who oversees. We have an elder who meets these qualifications of character. And so what is a pastor? Well, a pastor, from a biblical standpoint, is a shepherd to the flock of God. So, I'm going to take you to a text, which is 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. So, if you could turn your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. The reason why I want to take you to this text is because in this text, you will see all three Greek words... You will see elders, which is presbyteros. You will see a shepherd, which is poimen. And you will see overseer, which is episcope. And so we'll look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. If you want to study these titles further, you can also look at Acts chapter 20. Verses 17 through 28. And you can also look at Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. But 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 3 has all three titles in one passage. And we will read it. The elders, Greek presbyteros, who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder. This is Peter talking. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd, poi men, the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, episcope, not by compulsion but willingly, not for dishonest gain but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Verse 4, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So I know that different traditions and denominations use different titles, but from a biblical meaning... Bishop, elder, and pastor are synonymous terms that describe the same man. So when you think elder, think character or dignity. This is the the character or dignity of a man. And when you think pastor and bishop, think function or duty. Does that make sense? So that's what you'll also see in Acts chapter 20, verse 17 through 28. Paul calls the elders at Ephesus, and he tells them to shepherd the flock and to be overseers. Also in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, you will see a elder and overseer used interchangeably. So the elder is the dignity of a man, the pastor or a bishop is the duty of a man. So I would like to take this moment to call up our elders of the church who are currently serving on our elder board. So if you are currently serving on our elder board, if you could just Come up here to the front of the stage, and there's a microphone over there that one of you guys can grab. So I just want you guys to uh, be introduced to the elders of our church, and Pastor Carl and Pastor Al, if you can come up as well. So when you see the word elder in the Bible, um, you, you see it used as elders, or plural, 
that's how you see it most used. So it has the idea of this plurality of elders. And so our elder board is comprised of uh, three vocational pastors. That is uh, Pastor Carl, uh, Pastor Al, and myself. And we also have uh, three lay elders who work outside of the church. And so our elder board, we um, lead the church and we meet every single month and we require a unanimous vote on major church decisions. So that is the polity or the government of our church being elder-led as we see in the New Testament. So what I would like you guys to do is I would like you guys to introduce yourselves. A lot of people know who you are, but some people may not know who you are. And why don't you also um, tell tell them a little bit about your families and also tell them uh, how you serve at Antioch Bible Church. Hey, everyone. Uh, My name is Bob Elliott, and it is my humble privilege to be able to serve as an elder at Antioch Bible Church uh, for the past two years. Um, I've been attending Antioch for almost, or about 30 years. Uh, Met my awesome wife, Denise, here back in the mid-90s. And uh, we have two children that we raised. Um, They came through all of the youth programs that our church offered, and um, Antioch Bible Church definitely helped us raise them up in submission and reverence, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, I serve on the praise team. You guys see me up there pretty regularly on keyboards, so thank you. Good morning. My name's Andrew Cummins, and uh, my wife, Carrie, I have three kids, uh, all graduated, and uh, two of them graduated from California Baptist Church, one from Northwest uh, University, and so uh, I have been serving at Antioch for 30-some years just the same, and met my wife here at the uh, college and career group at the time. So uh, (laughs) leading into where I'm serving now uh, with the uh, youth group as well as the college group and uh, also with the uh, Levites uh, in the morning scene. So it's a privilege to serve here at Antioch. Thank you. Hello, I am uh, Robert Fulton, and um, let's see, I've been at Antioch for about uh, 22, 23 years as well, so a long time service, but I began coming to Antioch at a fertility prayer by uh, Pastor Hutch, and as a result of that, uh, we got pregnant, and so uh, I think the Lord said you should stay, and so we stayed, Um, but so I have two beautiful children, Uh, Grace is my oldest, she's 23, Uh, My youngest is 19, Ivy. Um, I also, my beautiful wife, Lisa, who is uh, in with the children right now. So, um, but uh, the Lord, I always say, has blessed me with a wife that has a tremendous amount of mercy and grace for me. And so I am so blessed by that. But uh, thank you. My name is Al Vallette, and um, I've been attending Antioch since it was five months old, and uh, so approaching 40 years, and been on staff. Uh, September 1 will be 28 years, the beginning of my 28th year as a pastor here, and um, my beautiful wife back there, Danielle, is um, you know, part of the worship team, worship arts team, and we have a son, 23, who I took into my home when he was seven from Kirkland Heights. And he's 23 and serving in the Navy at Oak Harbor. And uh, so he's in his fifth year. But I'm responsible for congregational care. Um, what else? <laughs> I don't know. Everything that Pastor Herb just tells me to do. Um, benevolence and, um, and then also um, a responsible for Kirkland Heights and be praying for them. We're going to restart them back up with, with, uh, in October. So uh, just thankful to serve alongside these great men. Uh, my name's Carl Payne, and uh, I started working here uh, June 15th of 1992. And my wife is Gail, and 
heck, she's been here four weeks in a row, which for someone that's physically had some challenges and she didn't get to come this week. And I thought, man, after four in a row being here, but God's got a better plan, I guess. I have one son. No, not that I guess, I know. I have, I have one son, Jonathan. Uh, he is in Arkansas. And for those of you that love the computer things, you and, you and he would get along very well. For me, it's still kind of foreign language, but uh, that's why I've got a kid that can help me when I need help. Uh, my work has been primarily in the area of discipleship training. If I can do it, you can do it and leadership development, but like Al, we're both available to just wear the hats and take on whatever Pastor Hutch originally and now Pastor Herb, if they ask us to do it and we can do it, we try to do it. So it's been a privilege. Thank you. Will you give our elder board a round of applause? All right. Well, I'm glad you guys could be more familiar uh, with our elders. I know it's not a qualification, but I think we're a good-looking group. <laughs> Amen. And I know they seemed all serious, but they're just a bunch of jokesters, a bunch of clowns. But uh, I'm clowning around with them, so we, we have fun. So as you look at uh, verses uh, 2 through 7 in 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, what we will see is uh, the character or dignity of an elder. So you saw uh, us six men uh, up here. And so now we'll look at, you know, what is required. So in verses two through seven, uh, I think my math is good, but I count 16 qualifications that represent the highest moral standard of a Christian. And so while you may not be an elder, it should be your goal to have Christ-like character. And this is a good reminder that ministry leadership is more about character than gifting. A lot of people lead with the gifting. Well, he speaks really well, or he serves in this area really well. But that's not what the Bible leads with. The Bible leads with 16 characteristics or character traits. And these character traits can be developed by each of you from walking with the Lord. So let's take a look at some of these traits. The first one says blameless. So as I describe these traits, I don't want it to be some type of a boring exercise that when is he going to get through all 16? So what I'm trying to do in describing these traits is to give you an accurate definition, um, sometimes using the original language so you can understand uh, what exactly is being asked of these elders with high moral character. And I'm also going to give you a peek into my life. And um, what these uh, character traits mean to me and how on some of them they come easier to me and some of them come harder for me. And that's what it's going to be like for all of us. You'll look at some of these and you'll be like, man, that's not an issue. But some of them you'll say, wow, that is an issue and I really need to grow. So let's look at the first one is blameless. So blameless. So a great example of that is the elders, especially the three lay elders, they're elected to, or not elected, but appointed by the Holy Spirit to a three-year term. But before they're able to serve as elders, we put them before the congregation and we ask you, do any of you have an objection to their character? And so that's what we do, and that's what we did for um, Rob and uh, for Andy and for Bob. And there were no objections uh, to their character, which means they are blameless. 
So they are not sinless, but they are blameless. I like what John Calvin said in a paraphrase. Not marred by disgrace. So the next one, husband of one wife. So for me personally, I would not be quick to rule out a a spiritually mature single man. Uh, The Apostle Paul was single. But I would say that most elders are married. All of our elders are married, and they're married and faithful to one woman. So we can't have any Solomons. Y'all just getting that. (laughs) He had too many. Let's just put it it that way. So, and you you look at husband of one wife. So we talked about this in last week's sermon, that there is ample scope for women to serve in ministry. But this office of bishop, elder, pastor, all meaning the same thing, is reserved for a qualified man. And this harks back to the reasoning that Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. We look at the next um, character trait of high moral standard is temperate. So this refers to someone who is careful to watch out for potential dangers or harmful addictions. This person keeps their head in all situations. Sober-minded is very close akin to temperate. Sober-minded person is self-controlled with a sound mind. Next, we have good behavior. Believe it or not, if you look back in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, we were talking about that the women... Uh, should adorn themselves in modest apparel. The Greek word for modest is the same Greek word that we see here of good behavior. So the clothing of women and the behavior of men should be well arranged and orderly. Next you see hospitable which literally means loving the stranger. So this goes beyond a gathering with people like us because it's so easy to gather with people who look like us, that talk like us, that dress like us, but it's about loving the stranger, the person who is different than you, that has different interests, that has a different faith background. This is what it means to be hospitable, is to love the stranger. And this will enable us to work together to fulfill the mission of our church. And the mission of our church is simple. It's to proclaim salvation and make disciples. And you cannot proclaim salvation and make disciples if you hang around people who are saved disciples. You have to venture out and love the stranger to fulfill the mission of our church. The next qualification is able to teach. And I know some people get tripped up on this, so I just want to bring clarity. It's not a requirement for all elders to labor in preaching and teaching. Because it clearly says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So it's my role to labor in the word and doctrine, but that, that's not everyone's role on the elder board. But an elder must be able to teach in the sense of giving sound instruction in the doctrine of the gospel. Next, we come to one that has plagued many, and I'm sure it's 
probably been a part of some of your lives, but it's not given to wine. So this literally means staying near wine. So having to have wine close to you at all times, which makes you drink in excess. Now people say, well, they drank wine in the Bible. Why can't I drink wine? Well, in the first century, it's a well-known fact that the water was not healthy. So they mixed wine with water for health purposes. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, Paul tells Timothy, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. So wine was more like a Brita water filter. <laughs> So that's not an excuse to be close to the bottle at all times. You guys like that Brita water filter? That just came. <laughs> um, now, there is a debate whether pastors and elders should drink at all. I'm not here to solve that debate today. But what, what I will give you is two guiding scriptures for me. And that's one, Ephesians 5.18. It says, do not be drunk with wine. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the second scripture is Romans chapter 14, verse 21. It says, do not cause your brother to stumble. Elders and pastors would have to set the example. Now, we're going to come across one here that has been harder for me and more difficult for me to overcome. And you might say, really? Really. Not violent. You say, well, pastor, you don't seem violent at all. You're not scary. You're not intimidating. And I praise the Lord for that. I, I hope you think of me in that way. Not violent means not a striker. So, Chuck Swindoll wrote, a godly overseer is not even apt to clench his fist. But as a result of my childhood, this has been more difficult for me to overcome. So without going into great detail, I just want to tell you that there's some areas in your life that will take more work for you to overcome. Like, for example, with the wine, I have never liked alcohol. Even before I was a believer, I've never liked it. And I was focused on my athletics, and I didn't want anything to hinder me in sports. So it's never been an issue. Alcohol is not a temptation for me whatsoever. And you guys say, well, it must be nice. <laughs> but it is a temptation for me to be violent or to be a striker or to make sure that I stand my ground. It's a temptation for me when I get angry to clench my fists. And this is something that I have to watch very carefully, not only in public, but in private, in my home life. Because if you're a man and you have the um, propensity to be violent, then that means you'll be slamming doors. That means you'll be throwing things. And it can even go to the extent of assaulting your wife and your children. So these are various, very serious things that we must consider. But by the grace of God, I do not consider myself to be a violent man anymore. But I'm not saying that I'm perfect in this area. It's still an area that, that has to be monitored. So not greedy for money. Once again, I'm thankful that this is not an issue for me. 
If it was, I could definitely see how it could be problematic, especially leading a church. But many um, false teachers see the ministry as a means for gain. They enter the ministry to be rich. And I know this really doesn't make sense to you guys, but you go overseas and to, in Africa and Asia, and it's one of the quickest ways uh, to make money to have someone who speaks well and has this book. And of course, they twist the book and take things out of context. And I know that many of you, uh, you may be young, and you may think, hey, I want to get money, because if I get money, I'm going to be successful. Well, I, I've always liked the words of Agur in Proverbs. And this is Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. And here's what Agur said in Proverbs 30. I'm going to paraphrase it for you. He said, give me neither poverty nor riches, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. So Agur is saying, hey, if I have too much money, I might deny the Lord. Have you ever been in that position? Right when I came out of college, I started work as a financial planner. I was making money. I was successful. I had more money than all of my friends. And I remember one of my friends in college, he asked me, are you still going to be a pastor? And I had the hand on the steering wheel to my Mercedes Benz. And I had my custom suit. And I had the plaques on my wall, this young, up-and-coming financial advisor in Bellevue. And I turned over to my friend and said, I don't know. Because sometimes when you get money, it just distorts who you are. But at the same time, I have been poor. I remember when I before I started in uh, financial planning, I really didn't have much money at all, and I was married, and there was one evening that I really wanted a Frosty. <laughs> Man, I just wanted a Frosty from Wendy's, the chocolate Frosty. And uh, so I was looking around for some money, I don't think there was any money in my bank account at that time. Might have been a little overdrafted. Have some of y'all been there? All right, just me, praise the Lord. <laughs> well, uh, then I started looking around in my car, and I started looking, and I found some nickels and some pennies. But I quite couldn't come up with a dollar for a Frosty. So I had to walk back inside my house. I think I probably looked under the couch and stuff like that. I didn't have enough money for a Frosty. And I said, man, I remember one time I was actually at UW and I was on the football team and not on scholarship. So I just had money added to my card. And at that time, I was a big guy uh, playing football around 240 pounds. And I just got real hungry. But there was no money on my card. And so I was like, hey, I'm either going to uh, steal this cookie uh, from the UW's uh, little store right here in the hub, or I'm just going to be hungry. I stole the cookie. I'm just saying, so I've experienced a little bit of rich, and I've experienced a little bit of being poor. But for me, God just keep me in the middle. I'm good. I just want the water view in heaven. All right. I'm, I want the water view, the downtown condo overlooking the river of life that comes down from the throne of God, leading to the tree that bears 12 different fruits for each type of month. I want easy access to the temple if that exists in heaven. That's what I'm looking for. 
I, think, I still want a water view in here, but my wife said, you know, honey, you chose the wrong profession for a water view. So if y'all have water views, just invite me over to your house and let me stay a little bit. So not greedy for money. So let's go to the next one, which is a gentle. So a pastor or elder must be able to take criticism without reacting to the, in the flesh. This is a hard thing to do. I have a 48-hour rule. When I get criticized, and sometimes it just rolls off, but sometimes it, it sticks. So I take 48 hours, a couple days to pray, to gather my thoughts, and to respond in the spirit. Whenever I break the 48-hour rule, it does not go well. So I want to encourage you, you go ahead and adopt that 48-hour rule. When it comes to criticism, it'll help you respond in a more gentle way. Then it says not quarrelsome. So this is a peacemaker, not someone who stirs up division. So our elder board and even the staff at our church, we have peace. And I'm really thankful for that. I was talking to um, our HR director, Simon Shoebridge, and he reminded me that in our staff at our church office, we have a very healthy work environment. We have a peaceful and joyful work environment. And he said, Pastor, he said, I know you want everyone to get paid more. I know you want to increase everyone's salaries. And we have done that and will continue to do that. But he said there is a value in having a healthy work environment. Warren Wearsby wisely said this, you can disagree without being disagreeable. And then we have not covetous. I want to encourage you to choose contentment over the blessings that God has given you. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Now as we go transition to verses 4 and 5, these are two verses that talks about a way that the man leads his home. And the home is proving ground for leadership. And men, this is tough. You know, I remember, you know, aspiring to be a pastor and having my home and having my wife and my son. And, uh, you know, seeing this verse, this inserted question in verse 5, for if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? And it's very true that an elder's wife and children are a reflection of his leadership. So you show me a man who has character, I want to meet his wife. I want to meet his children. So you can't just look at me, you have to look at my wife, Leela. You have to look at my uh, 18-year-old son, Herbie. He's going to be 18 on July 17th on Wednesday. Amen. You know, and Herbie is special needs disabled, but when you look at Herbie, what does that tell you about me? When you look at Leela, what does that tell you about me? When you look at my eight-year-old son, Theo, what does that tell you about me? And the same thing goes for all of our elders. Verses six and seven give the elder or the pastor two warnings. The first warning is in verse 6. It says, not a novice. So you can't be a spiritual rookie and be a pastor. Now, you know, I actually tried to do this in my zeal for God. When I was in college, I went to my pastor and I said, Pastor Sims, I'm ready to start a church. He said, huh? <laughs> I said, I'm ready to start a church. You know, our Bible study is called KRC, Keeping It Real for Christ. Well, Pastor Sims, I'm going to start 
KRCC, keeping it real for Christ Church. And he's like, hold on, <laughs> hold on, sorry, reel me in a little bit. I was a spiritual rookie when I was in college. But you, you don't want to be a spiritual rookie and be a pastor because you can face the danger of pride which many, including Satan, have endured a great fall. And as you go to verse 7, the the last character trait that we see from a pastor or elder is someone with a good testimony with outsiders. So these are people outside of the church, outside of the faith. Do you have a good reputation and testimony with outsiders? Those people who don't, Go to church, those people who don't believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Are you truthful? Are you kind? Are you loving? Are you gracious? These are qualities that all people appreciate. And if you don't have a good testimony with outsiders, How are you going to fulfill the mission of the church? How are you going to proclaim salvation and make disciples? So to reach people with the gospel, you have to have a good testimony. Now, as we looked at the titles of bishop, pastor, and elder, and came to the conclusion from Scripture that they are synonymous terms, all describing the same man, And then we looked at verses 2 through 7, I believe 16 character qualifications of an elder or pastor. Now I want to leave everyone with a takeaway. I want to leave you with application from this message today. And the takeaway that I want to give you, if you're taking notes, write this down, growth. And the growth that I'm speaking about is the success of character. So you may have come across these terms before. I don't know if you're like me. You know, I'm an ambitious, goal-oriented person. And so what I do is I underline areas where I need to improve. And so I remember, like in my college years back in 2004, I would read this list, and there was a lot of ink underlining a lot of areas where I constantly fell short. But the truth is, I had zeal for Christ, leading a Bible study, wanting to start a church, sharing the gospel. But my character had not yet been developed. I want to give you guys this truth today to help you with your mindset. I was at an event a couple weeks ago, and someone who knew me from those days back in 2004, this is 20 years ago, had brought up a past sin of mine. I didn't have time for the 48-hour rule. (laughs) I had to take that criticism off the chest. But what, what I told this person who brought up a past sin, is I said, I was trying my best, but I was young in my faith. And she didn't say anything after that. And so I want you guys to have that mindset because we all have past sins. (laughs) Laundry list, if we all were truthful and laid them all out, it would be really difficult. We all have past sins, but why don't you adopt that mindset to your past sins or to someone who brings up a past sin, whether in jest or maybe they really are trying to criticize you, and just tell them, you know what? I was young in my faith, but I was trying my best, but God has brought me a long way, hasn't he? You know? So think about that, that mindset for your life. And then now in 2014, 10 years later, 
I was ordained as a pastor in North Carolina. I know up here, like in Washington, ordination is not, you know, that big of a deal culturally. People don't walk around and say, hey, you're a pastor, are you ordained, are you ordained? They don't really do that in Washington. But in North Carolina, that culture, it's important to be ordained. It's a validation. So if you're a pastor, but you're not yet ordained, it's like you're not yet, you know, fully uh, confirmed in your role. So in 2014, uh, I was ordained. And I remember at the ordination ceremony that one of the pastors at Greystone Church, he read all of the qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And on behalf of the pastoral staff at Greystone, I think there was like six or seven of them on my ordination council, they said, we testify that Herb possesses these qualities. So for me, that was a big moment in my life. I was so humbled. I was so overwhelmed. And it was just like, wow, I can't believe that they think that about me. That all of these pastors think that I fit these qualifications that I just shared with you. So it was absolutely awesome. But I knew in 2014 that there were still areas that I needed to grow in and work on. And I said, Lord, before I become a senior pastor, can I please have these things taken care of? <laughs> Some of these things that I still kind of struggle with a little bit, a little more than I wanted to struggle with. But so now in 2024, so 2004, 2014, 2024, I come back to these list of qualities this past week. And I was really amazed at how much I've grown. I was actually surprised. So I'm not perfect. I'm not trying to say I'm perfect. But there's nothing in my life that is glaring. And I was just like, wow, Herb, you have grown a lot. God has worked in your life a lot. Now, this has been 20 years of commitment. So it's not like I've been a Christian for 20 years. You have to understand, since I was 19 years old, I made a decision to commit to God. And that commitment has evolved over time. And certainly, I did make mistakes when I was young, but this was a strong commitment. 20 years. I heard someone say, depending upon who you talk to, it takes 15 or 20 years to become an overnight success. And I think that we need to redefine success. A lot of people define success on a money or a position or what you do, but my identity is not in what I do as a preacher. Or as a leader of a church, my identity is in who I am as a person. So when you talk about, am I successful, am I not successful, let's look at the growth of our character over a long period of time. And if you are consistent in your obedience, over a long period of time, you will grow in Christ-like character. So that's what I want you guys to take away today, is that growth in character. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, we thank you um, for your word. 
And Lord, everything you do for us and how you teach us through your word. Father, I want to pray for each and every person today at Antioch, every person listening, and those outsiders who haven't even uh, come to the faith quite yet. Father, I want to pray for each and every person that they will see this list as not only uh, qualifications for elders and pastors and bishops, but, Father, that they will see this list as the highest moral standard, as a template for them to develop godly character. Father, may each and every person here, male or female, strive for the highest measure of character. And Lord, we know that that character is found in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus is the bishop and overseer of our souls. If there is anyone here today who has not put their faith in Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to take the next step of salvation. Salvation means that you realize that you're a sinner separated from God and that you want to put your faith in Jesus Christ to reconcile yourself to God and to be brought into relationship with him. So if you don't have salvation today, I want to encourage you to take that next step. If that's you, just raise your hand where you are and keep your hand up, and I just simply want to pray for you, and as a church, we want to help you grow in your faith. Is there one person today who wants to take that next step of salvation? There is one person who wants to take that next step of salvation. You're ready to take that step today? Today. The Bible says today is the day for salvation, brother. You're ready today. Awesome. If there's someone online and you want to take that next step, why don't you raise your hand with this brother who's already has his hand raised here, and I want to pray for you. So, brother, what I'm going to say is I'm going to say a prayer, and you can repeat the prayer after me. And what I'll also ask is for our church family to repeat the prayer with me and with you so we're all in this together. Because you're now a part of God's family. And you're part of our church family. And it's not so much uh, the exact words that you say, it's what you really believe in your heart. So the words that I'm going to say are something like this, um, that you're a sinner and that you believe Jesus is Lord. And that you believe he died on the cross and rose again. And that you're putting your faith in Jesus for eternal life in heaven. Are you ready to give your life to Christ today? All right. Well, I'm going to pray in church family. Please uh, agree with me in prayer as this brother repeats his words. Say, dear God. I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus is Lord. I believe he died on the cross for my sins and rose again. So today I put my faith in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. Amen. 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 Well, we rejoice today. 
proclaiming salvation and making disciples. We have a new brother in Christ. His name is Kevin. One thing I want to say about Kevin is he's a custodian where I get my hair cut at the barber shop. And in the fall, I invited him to Easter. And he said he's coming to Easter. Well, Kevin came to Easter service. But Kevin has not missed a service since Easter Sunday. And I asked Kevin, I said, do you want to be saved? And he said, I'm, I'm taking it slow. I'm not ready quite yet. But today our brother raised his hand. Amen. And he's glad about it. Amen. Amen. Well, let's worship the Lord. Let's stand to our feet. If you need prayer, uh, we will have people on the sidewalls who you can uh, pray with. And if you just want to rejoice from this message, if you want to rejoice in Kevin's salvation, you just stand right where you are and praise the Lord that he is holy. Amen? Amen. Amen.